I want to uh, take us, uh, my text this morning uh, from uh, James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. If you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 1202. The letter of James chapter 5 and beginning at verse 13, which I'd like to read again, just so it's fresh in our minds. James chapter 5 and beginning at verse 13. And James, who was, in fact, the half-brother of Jesus, the oldest after Jesus, born to Joseph and Mary, and who, while Jesus was doing his ministry, was not a believer. In fact, there's at least one passage in the Gospel of John where James and the other brothers mock Jesus. But after the resurrection, and the resurrection can be kind of convincing, (laughs) they became believers, and James sort of ascended and became a chief leader in the earliest church based in Jerusalem. But here he is writing to these fellow believers in the first century. And he says, if any among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sin he will be forgiven and therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working indeed Elijah was a man with nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on earth And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, or brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This morning I want to talk about prayer, praise, healing, and forgiveness. Prayer, praise, healing, and forgiveness. Indeed, these are the subjects that James mentions as he's wrapping up this letter. A letter, as I mentioned just moments ago, that he wrote to fellow believers in Christ in the first century. A letter that you and I have been studying together for the past for Sundays. This makes five. (laughs) And the first thing that James mentions in our text is prayer. Notice again verse 13. And if anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Or as Peterson puts it in the the message, are you hurting? (laughs) Then pray. Indeed, prayer is what God calls us to when we're suffering. Uh, Oswald Chambers, in his famous book, written decades ago and still in print, called My Utmost for His Highest, wrote this. He said, we tend to use prayer as sort of a last resort. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything else. God wants us to pray before we do anything else. And so James says... Is any among you suffering? Then pray. Share it with God. And truth be told, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort. In fact, we can get quite focused on doing all that we can to avoid suffering. And yet, as all of us know, it it comes just the same, doesn't it? And suffering is, perhaps, as Brother Lawrence described it in his famous book, The Practice of the Presence of God, actually, as he described it, a blessing in disguise. An opportunity, if you will, to learn things about yourself and to learn things about God. When I was a young believer in my teens and 20s, I was a great Andre Crouch fan, Black Gospel, and one of his all-time famous songs was a song called Through It All. And this is how the third verse goes. 
I thank God for the mountains, and I thank God for the valleys. I thank God for the storms he's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in his word could do. That's what comes from suffering and doing it with God. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God can solve them. I'd never know what faith in his word could do. And so James says, if any of you are suffering, let him pray. And then James mentions praise. Notice verse 13 again. If any among you are suffering, let him pray. And if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. I think maybe we're a little, maybe a little better with the first than the second. That when troubles strike, we may be more likely to pray than when there aren't any troubles to praise him. But that's what he says. And is anyone cheerful? Then praise. Or that is to say, praise God when all is going well. And to my thinking, this is essentially a call to gratitude. Is everything going well? Then praise the Lord. Give him thanks. Thomas Merton wrote this about gratitude. He said, to be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything that he has given us. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace from him. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive. It is constantly awakened to new wonder and praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful man or the grateful woman knows that God is good, not from hearsay, not because other people say so. The grateful man knows by experience that God is good. And that makes all the difference. Or as someone else has written, gratitude is the fruit that makes everything else taste sweet. <laughs> and so that's the first two things, prayer and praise. Then James talks about healing. Notice, beginning at verse 14. And if any among you is sick, let him or her call for the elders of the church, the, the presbyters, the pastors, the priests, the leaders. Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And then notice the second part of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so James says, um, uh, when you're sick, let the pastor know about it. Now, of course, there's different levels of sickness. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think, you know, if you just had a common cold maybe to call or something like that. Don't, don't, if you stub your toes, you'll probably be all right. Don't, don't ring me. Uh, but boy, I tell you what, if you're in the hospital, I sure want to know about it. In fact, if, I, I, if, if you feel the need, I want to know. And in fact, sometimes I don't know what's going on, and one of you will tell me about somebody who's sick, and I get to ring them up. And if, it, if it's a serious matter, then yeah, I'll turn up in, in, at, at the hospital. I've been in the hospital with some of you. And I've prayed for you and anointed you. I've come to your homes when that was suitable. I have prayed and I have anointed people in the, in the gathering space. <laughs> I remember one time a, a guy was a man, homeless man, was uh, attending the Bible study at the Lord of the Streets. This was before COVID. Um, and uh, he was telling us about cancer. He had cancer. And uh, he, was, he had a doctor. He was telling us about the doctors and things. And they were 
fi trying to figure out what the best next thing was to do. And the next week he wasn't there, and the following week, and about three weeks later, I was heading south on Fannin from Lord of the Streets to come back to uh, the Sugarland area. And I saw him on the street. And Fannin, of course, is one-way street, and so I, I had to go around the block to catch up with him. And uh, he went into a convenience store, and so I went and I parked in the, in the parking lot there at the convenience store and went into the store looking for him. I found him at the potato chips and asked him how he was doing. And he told me, and I said, well, let's just pray. And so I, I prayed, and then I always carry this oil stock with me. And right there at the potato chips, we prayed, and I anointed him with oil in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And James speaks of prayer and tells us to seek prayer because prayer, as he says, is effective. Indeed, James says that God works his will through our prayers. When we believe that he's able to do what he's promised to do. Notice again, verse 15. And the prayer of faith, that is the faith of the one who's praying, or as I think... Um, uh, Peterson puts it in the message, the believing prayer. <laughs> the believing prayer will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And James says that the prayer of, a, of, a, of the righteous, the righteous woman or the righteous man is powerful. Notice verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as to its working, and then he gives Elijah as an example. Indeed, God often working through our prayers, indeed always God working through our prayers, is indispensable to healing. Because we have so many doctors, we may not immediately think so. But God is indispensable. Indeed, uh, doctors are great. I go to doctors, you go to doctors. We should go to doctors. I'm not telling you not to go to the doctor. But what I am telling you this morning, and you maybe have never thought about this, doctors are not enough. In fact, Norman Geisler in his book, Signs and Wonders, he wrote this. He said, doctors are the first to admit that they don't actually heal anyone. <laughs> the physician can set the bone, but only God, the great physician can cause the bone to grow together again. <laughs> He's the one who causes the bone to grow together again. And so he's indispensable to healing. Finally, James talks about forgiveness. And in particular, James talks about forgiveness in two ways, namely forgiveness that comes as a result of confession and forgiveness that comes in association with spiritual restoration, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the first is forgiveness that comes as a result of confession. Notice again the second half of verse 15. And if, the, and if he, that is the person who's sick, has committed sin, it will be forgiven. And then notice verse 16. I don't know if everybody knows that this is in the Bible. Verse 16, therefore... Since God forgives, therefore confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins to one another. And so uh, sickness and sin sometimes is related. Sometimes it's not. In fact, in the scriptures we have examples of both. In fact, you remember that the apostles asked uh, Jesus, and, and, and who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says it has nothing to do with that. He's born blind that you might see the glory of God, and he healed the blind man. And once I was blind, and now I see. John chapter 9. That's where we get that famous phrase. But in John chapter 5, he says to the man who was around the pool and had been lame all of his life, he said, would you be healed? And long story short, Jesus healed him. And the, what did Jesus say? And go and sin no more, lest the worst thing happen to you. So it's not either or, but both and. But what we know about true confession, whether our sin is a result of sickness or not, true confession always results 
in forgiveness. In fact, what does John say in his first letter? First John chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's a lie, by the way. It's a deception. If we say we have no sins, we lie to ourselves. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, verse 9, if we confess our sins, the word in the Greek is homologeo. It means to say the same thing. To confess your sins is to say about your sins that you did this and I agree with you, Lord. <laughs> I agree with you. I say the same thing. This is awful. This is what sent your son to the cross. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And won't you forgive me? And he says, all you have to do is ask. <laughs> Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to wash us of all unrighteousness. And so James directs us to confess because of this great result that always comes, and not only to God, which you might feel very comfortable with, but also to one another, which might be a terribly scary thought. In, in some traditions in the church, you, you confess to the priest. You'd never think of confessing your sins to other people. I mean, you have appearances to keep up. As if nobody knows or that nobody does what you do. <laughs> but that's just exactly what people do who are serious about change. When I was with the men this last Saturday, I shared, I didn't get into details of it, but just shared in passing things that us, something that I struggle with. Uh, uh, judging from the nods I got, I guess they <laughs> struggle with it too. <laughs> and that's what people do that are serious. In fact, I think that from a pastor's standpoint, it's probably comforting that I would be willing to do that it, to obey this, to what, I mean, what does it look like? What does it look like when people confess their sins? I think probably it's very difficult for us to come up with models because we're constantly defending ourselves. We don't confess our sins. We, we rationalize and defend them <laughs> and tell people it's not sin. <laughs> but it is. And those who are serious about change are what the prayer book describes as amendment, true uh, amendment of life. Confess. They're truthful. They're people of truth, people of light. And when darkness is in them, they go, here it is. <laughs> Lord, deliver me. And maybe some person that they can trust who's loving, who won't condemn, they'll go to that person and say, I'm struggling with this. You may not have that kind of a relationship, but I rec highly recommend it. It's extremely liberating. In fact, if you've ever done shameful things and shared them with another person who loves you and then says, well, God, there's, there's no sin God can't forgive. <laughs> it's absolutely liberating. And that person sitting before you is like God come in the flesh, saying what God would say if God would speak to us in an audible way. David Taylor in his book, Open and Unafraid, The Psalms as a Guide of Life, he wrote this. He said, confession is an opportunity to be free from the secrets that distort and oppress us. Which is somewhat reminiscent, reminiscent of that famous adage from the recovery community, you're only as sick as the secrets you keep. So that's the first thing, forgiveness that comes as a result of confession. Then John, John, James talks about forgiveness that comes in association with spiritual restoration. Notice verses 19 and 20. He's talking to fellow believers, my brothers. This is the, I think this is the 15th one. He says, uses this phrase 15 times in his letter. My brothers or my brothers and sisters, as we would probably put it today. If any among you wanders from the truth, like all oh, we like sheep have gone astray, right? My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, 
Let that person who brings him back know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death at his judgment, divine judgment, and will cover a multitude of sins. And so what James is saying here is that in fact we are our brother's keeper. Indeed, when a fellow believer wanders away, our calling is to reach out. When something is, a, in fact, I saw somebody today that I hadn't seen in a couple of weeks. And it was, it was unusual because I see that person every week. That's the pattern. When people turn up to Christmas and Easter, I don't usually worry in the summertime how they're doing. That's their pattern. But when somebody who's here all the time misses two weeks, then I go, hey, what's going on? I think maybe tomorrow I need to make a phone call and just check up and say, are you all right? Is there anything I can do to help? And someone, one, maybe one is, and it's, maybe it's not wandering, but just being aware of what's going on. If somebody, in fact, you might, sometimes I get a report like that, so-and-so is having a hard time, is concerned about faith, or they, maybe they are started to engage in something that God tells us not to do, and you reach out in humility. In fact, uh, that was something else that we were talking about uh, on, on uh, Saturday at the, at the men's. We don't feel qualified because we've got our own faults. Well, start with that. <laughs> when you go to this person and say, look, nobody's perfect. I'm not. I got my own junk I'm trying. In fact, let me tell you what my junk is. And what you're doing is wrong and it's going to take you no good place. And I just want to reach out and let you know that I love you and I care for you and I want to support you in whatever way I can. Uh, uh, you, and they may ask questions and you don't know how to answer them. They say, well, let's, let's go talk to Scott or somebody else who might be able to, other layperson who might be able to answer the questions that are being raised or whatever it is. But the last thing is just to, to let it go and treat ourselves and other people as if we're islands. We're not islands. Don't ask, as Dunn said, don't ask for whom the, toll, uh, the, the bell tolls. The bell tolls for you. We're all in the same storm, even if we're not all in the same boat. And so a fellow believer will reach out. And James says that if that believer comes back and reconnects, that believer, as he describes it, will be delivered <laughs> from his or her sin and where that might be taking that person and be forgiven with the presumption of confession and repentance and all of that through us, through you, you standing in the breach, you doing what might seem a hard thing because you love enough to do it, which might lead to being unappreciated, misunderstood, and falsely accused, but you're willing to take that risk because you love that person who's wandering off. Indeed, when James speaks of the covering a multitude of sins, what he's talking about, if we understand this in the biblical tradition, is, is forgiveness. In fact, in Psalms chapter 32 and verse 1, we read, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It's a Hebrew parallelism. Forgiveness and covering stand for the same thing. And it's our calling as believers to reach out in love to those who go astray. The goal being that they might respond and repent and be restored. In fact, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul, being the writer to another Christian community, the churches of Galatia what is now southern Turkey, he says, brothers, if any one of you is trapped in a transgression, trapped, <laughs> if any one of you is trapped in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one <laughs> in the spirit of gentleness. That's humility and love. And so this is what, is, what God is saying to us this morning through the Apostle James. If you suffer, pray. And if you're happy, give praise to God. And if you're sick, ask for prayer that you might be healed. And if you're sinning, confess it. 
and be forgiven. And if someone you know is wandering away from the faith, reach out that they might be restored. Indeed, if we are true believers in Jesus Christ, this is our mutual calling, not just mine, but also yours. Prayer, praise, healing, and forgiveness. Let us pray. Almost sort of arbitrary things, Lord. And yet they really aren't arbitrary because they were all mentioned earlier in his letter. <laughs> Just making application and things that we need to hear. I need to hear it. We need to hear it. To enhance the quality of our life, to make us more like the prophets, to make us more like Christ, to make us more like what it looks like to be truly dedicated and have our center in the kingdom of God instead of just the American dream. Indeed, Lord, deliver us from cultural Christianity and make our Christianity just the way you always meant it to be, authentic, centered in Christ, full of light and truth and honesty and such things as these we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.